In the 1980s, bosses had an inherent novelty to them that just doesn't exist these days. Don't get me wrong, boss fights have absolutely improved since then, but now that boss fights have become an accepted norm, they have to work much harder to be impressive, rather than just throwing a stronger monster at you. I mean, the first Mega Man bosses were incredibly basic patterns, the first Castlevania bosses could be wrecked with holy water, and the first Bowser fights were just a single jump. They were fun in their own way, but they weren't really the focus. A dessert course to the real meat of the platforming stage preceding them. Making a Shadow of the Colossus-style boss rush game in those days seemed almost unthinkable. Designing a complex boss was exceptionally difficult, and even if you got a good gimmick going, keeping that up to sustain an entire game seemed both impossible and mind-numbingly repetitive. Punch-Out, though? Punch-Out strove to be different. The game seemed doomed to meet the fate of other arcade ports on the NES, shallow imitations of their complex cabinet counterparts. A boss rush was possible with the snappiness of quarter-gobbling, trial-and-error learning, but translating that to the home consoles seemed like a recipe for disaster. Moreover, Punch-Out! was an arcade darling because of its uniqueness. Voice samples, a two-screen display to keep information spread out, intensely detailed and expressive sprites taking over the whole screen, a hot new see-through wireframe perspective to immerse the player in the fight, the NES had the ability to make exactly none of this a reality. Punch-Out! should have been a simple, uninteresting flop of a game that encouraged you to visit the arcade and play the good version there. Yet somehow, the designers of Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! were able to create one of the most memorable, challenging, and legacy-defining games of the NES era. Punch-Out! looks like nothing else on the system, in a way that's not only technically impressive, but utterly daunting to go up against. It defined and challenged what video game boss fights could be, and created, I would argue, the most memorable showdowns between player and game of its time. And while one dynamite example stands out above all the others, covering him alone would be a disservice to all the incredible fights before him. Thus, we're going the distance. This month is devoted to the incredible design, legacy, and ferocity of Punch-Out! Going four rounds, league by league, with the granddaddy of all boss fights. Every single fight will be broken down as we explore each fighter's genre-defining brand of intimidation. Before we tackle the minor league, though, we need to know how all of this is possible. Punch-Out! uses technical wizardry on a grand scale to create its petrifying pugilists, and the effort put in cannot be ignored. Due to... reasons I'm nowhere near qualified to explain, the NES could only display eight sprites on each of its scan lines at once. Now that doesn't seem too bad, but each sprite is constrained to an 8x8 pixel square. This little Mario sprite is secretly a meta sprite, consisting of four sprite boxes stitched together to make something more appealing than, well, a box. On top of that, each of these box sprites can only contain four colors, including transparent. So if you wanted to give Mega Man some facial expressions, you need to mess with all sorts of sprite layering mojo. On top of that topping, each collection of four colors formed a palette, and the NES only allowed for a maximum of four sprite palettes at a time. Add in the primitive, basic base tools used to put them in, and it's a miracle that NES games looked as good as they did. Because of these limitations, you had two options for bosses. Make them small and unassuming, or slap them in the background layer and make them big, but nearly immobile and on a flat color background. Punch-Out! could not afford either of these. The game was about reading an opponent's motion, learning their tells, dodging their punches, and counter-punching. 
Having a tiny opponent would make this nearly impossible without pressing your face into the TV screen, and skipping out and using rigid, clunky animations would both ruin a player's sense of timing and be a disservice to the incredibly fluid, always-moving sport of boxing. To solve this, a custom chip, the MMC2, was developed and inserted into every punch-out cartridge. Boxers could now shift their hands, fall back, climb back up, change their expressions, and actually fluidly animate. Once the grunt work was done, remember, every single frame had to be hand-animated, and every hulking meta-sprite was being built up of 64 pixel blocks of bicep meat and pure testosterone, jigsaw puzzled together into a macho man. This extra work managed to create actual characters out of the bosses. Von Kaiser wasn't just a mean punching man, he was cocky. King Hippo didn't just punch you, he tried to club you and was horribly embarrassed by his wardrobe malfunctions. The player's hero, Little Mac, was shrunken down to a pitiful height to give these colossal fighters their space to show off and the sheer size of their gloves and the weight of their animations makes every hit taken feel like a semi-truck to the face. But it created a compelling David vs. Goliath story, the player overcoming not just hulking monstrosities, but fighters that seem outright better than Little Mac in everything they do. And the first of these intimidating monsters among men is Glass Joe. Surely you jest, Mr. Designing Four, I hear from the peanut gallery. You can't honestly be trying to sell me that Glass Joe is supposed to be intimidating. <laughs> Perish the thought. The man's record is 1 in 99. Most experienced players can take him down in a single round. He's from France, a country that still stigmatized as cowardly due to World War II. His name is a gag based on having a glass jaw, a boxing term for a weakling downed with a well-placed uppercut. He is, in characterization, reputation, and actual application, an utter joke of a character. Who couldn't beat this guy? <laughs> Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson's punch out, the best game ever. Did you ever beat yourself? I couldn't even beat glass. I can be glass joke. Put yourself into the position of someone who knows nothing about the game. A kid who just got the game for Christmas because they think Mike Tyson is awesome. Even if they know nothing about his actual sport except that punching is involved, I guess. The natural course of action is to button mash like a fighting game. Try to overwhelm this French dandy. But for how cowardly Glass Joe is, he has one advantage. His cowardice makes him keep his guard up and not even attack for the first 30 seconds of the fight, blocking punches thrown at him. As Joe deflects every hit they try to land, the player will rapidly drain hearts without any context of what they're doing or why isn't it working, until finally the game won't let him throw punches anymore. Joe's actually pretty decent at striking Mac when he's down finally taking the chance to go on the offensive, even throwing in some delayed punches with tricky timing and his very own special move. Players won't really understand what's going on, and for this reason, I actually think most challengers will lose to Glass Joe on their first attempt. Even though they don't yet understand the rules, they understand the humiliation. Glass Joe is a pansy Frenchman who constantly complains and says he's getting too old for this. And if anything, his reputation of being one of the most pathetic characters in gaming only strengthens this. All of those jokes get turned back onto the player, cause it implies that they're a fake gamer, one that couldn't even beat Glass Joe. And sure, maybe they'll toss the controller out the window at that point, but chances are they'll want to prove themselves to Iron Mike. Prove that someday they can be the very best like no one ever was. And through all of that, Doc Lewis is there to encourage them that maybe they shouldn't just mash mindlessly. Maybe they should... 
This allows the fundamental rule of Punch-Out to shine through. You are not a powerhouse, and you are almost always on the defensive, looking for a way in. Nothing feels quite like avoiding one of Joe's right hooks for the first time, and seeing the utter shock and horror on his face at a well-placed counter. After seeing Joe gain enough confidence to do a taunt, a player can smack him in the ribs and take him down in one punch. And when they put him down for good, well, it might not seem like much anymore, but this was the first step to becoming a real boxer for thousands of gamers the world over. Plus, it already proves that they're better than Tyson in at least one way. Glad Joe. Von Kaiser is next, and from his appearance alone, you can tell that this is no loser Frenchman. This is a German military man, a boxing teacher who thinks nothing of your puny frame in the face of German ingenuity and strength. And on the surface, he's got the skills to match. His jabs are very fast, enough to make dodging difficult and even rudely interrupt Mac's own punches. He's the first boxer to utilize the devastating uppercut, doing more damage than any other punch. He keeps his guard very tight, and gets up from the mat incredibly quickly. But while his technical skill is superior to Glass Joe, his pattern couldn't be simpler, as those two punches are all you'll ever see. Two different kinds, just like you, right? Well. If you punch him while he's delivering his uppercut, you'll always be granted a star. Probably the easiest star to get in the entire game. It's shiny and glittery, and it raises the little star counter up, so the player knows that getting it did something good, but what it does isn't exactly clear. And whether they figure it out by pushing one of the two remaining buttons on the controller or by looking it up in a manual, the point is, they'll have learned the star uppercut. Kaiser is programmed to always go down should they hit him with one, the player overcoming his uppercut by showing him what a real American uppercut looks like. The player is no longer in Glass Joe's shoes, desperately trying to block, avoid, and strike with little love taps where applicable. They're a powerhouse too. Von Kaiser can still occasionally fool them by fainting an uppercut, but now they're undeniably powerful beating up a foe who is all bark and no bite, and ready to unleash hell on the minor circuit champion, whoever he might be. Let's be honest, the first two fights could be tricky, but they weren't exactly what I'd call complex. Piston Honda, on the other hand, can be considered the game's first real challenge. Glass Joe and Von Kaiser were already larger than Mac, but Honda towers at over twice his height. He has both the jab and uppercut that Kaiser has, but they deal significantly more damage, and his uppercut is not only faster, but can't be countered like Kaiser's can. On top of that, he mixes in slower hooks to throw off your timing, meaning that a poorly timed dodge will be met with a glove to the head. Unlike Kaiser, who put all of his force out up front in a glorious German Blitzkrieg, Honda is built to last, and will easily take you through two or three rounds if you're unprepared. He gets up slowly, but he never gives up, merely taking time to catch his breath. Star uppercuts, while powerful, are nowhere near the instant win button against him like they are for Kaiser. He even has a unique animation when he wins, suggesting that the developers fully expected players to lose. Joe and VK were fun little cartoon villains, but Honda is a boxer. He knows the sport and will do everything with precision and strategy in order to win. But all of this pales in comparison to his secret weapon, the Honda Rush. A tsunami of alternating straights far too quick to dodge. You try to swerve out of his path, but no, another fist meets you right when you return to your original position. Pretty soon, you're absolutely winded, and a fierce hook or uppercut puts you down for the count. From close to full health to down, 
all in about 30 seconds. The solution, of course, is that you have to block his punches rather than dodge him, but an attack like this was needed in order to communicate the difference. While dodges can theoretically avoid everything, blocks are much faster and the only way to weather through a storm of repeated blows. While this does cost some stamina instead of the dodge's free advantage, Mac has trained himself up for this fight, and starts with a huge reserve of hearts to weather the storm. Piston Honda also tends to be weaker to body blows, teaching the player to mix up their punches after Glass Joe was so weak in the face. In fact, with exceptionally good timing, the player can counter the Honda Rush outright with a quick body blow, rewarding them with an instant knockdown. And with that, they've learned everything about the game's core mechanics. Aiming high and low, switching which hand to use, dodging, blocking, and when to best utilize the stars they've amassed. Experienced players can take him down quickly with tricks like star punching when there's a 4 on the counter, or when his eyes twitch. But for a new player, this'll likely be a bloody battle, utilizing everything they've learned, coming right down to the wire. And then, after the awards ceremony, they're out of the minor league. After gaining a lot of experience playing the game, it might be difficult to put yourself back into the position of a new player, but outside of just teaching the game's mechanics, I think Punch-Out! already does a phenomenal job at making its bosses feel insurmountable until you understand their patterns and idiosyncrasies. Don't forget to write down the password and join us next time as we take on the big boys in the Major League.